Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Raw Men. I think we're up to number 82, and now we're talking to a uh, paleontological uh, researcher and science writer. This is uh, Darren Nash, Ph.D., hoity-toity. And uh, let's see, you are behind the Tetrapod Zoology blog, which is features on Scientific American. You are, and you also do the Tetrapod Zoology podcast. And of course, you're also doing a Tet Zoo uh, conference or convention. Is that right? Yeah, convention. Yeah. All right. Well, tell me first. Uh, give me a, give me a little hint about the Tet Zoo convention that's going on. What what is that about? Yes, so um, this kind of emerged just as a, a kind of fun idea about five years ago. Um, some people suggested off the back of the blog, Tetraboard Zoology, which has now been going for 12 years, which seems pretty insane. But uh, um, it was suggested, you know, wouldn't it be great if the community that has sort of built up around the blog, that if there was an annual meeting? And uh, I work together on the, the podcast that you mentioned with a guy called John Conway, who's a scientific illustrator and paleo artist, and he suggested that we really should get this up and running as, as an event. We call it TetZooCon. We're currently, well, for 2018, oh dear, I've, I've already forgotten whether it's well, <laughs> whether we've had four or five of them, but we're on the fourth or fifth, and uh, this year's going to be our first two daya, so I, I feel it's, it's built year on year. Every single time the audience has gotten bigger by about a third, we're currently at, we had, we had 160-ish people last year, which is pretty good, and it's a... Uh, it's it's a reflection of everything that that, that I feel I'm involved in, uh, as in uh, natural history, uh, evolutionary biology, scientific communication, uh, disseminating information to the to the masses. So we do have um, you know some technical presentations. We have qualified technical experts, you know, leading experts in various fields, you know, in the audience as well as speaking. But it's open to everyone, and the bulk of our audience is made up of you know amateurs who are interested in science, um, people that are interested in just the art or even wildlife photography. And while I do predominantly come from a background, uh, a paleontological background, as, you, as you've mentioned, I'm a you know, qualified um, dinosaur specialist. Um, I'm interested in the whole of natural history and, and everything about science, the natural world. And so the talks that we have reflect that, you know, everything from people working in museums, people photographing nature to, you know, cutting edge science. And uh, I, you know, I, I don't want to sound <laughs> arrogant or grandiose, but I feel that we're filling that gap between like uh, popular conventions. I mean, it's not, a, it doesn't feel to me a million miles away from like, you know, a sci-fi convention or a comic convention. And at the other side of the table, um, te full technical conferences, which, non-qualified amateurs don't feel that they can go to those things in reality of course they can but they, they, there tends to be a feeling of exclusion rightly or wrongly and we're somewhere in the middle we're like a mix of that so i think this is a i think this is a pretty significant thing he says oh. arrogantly <laughs> <laughs> no it doesn't sound arrogant at all but then that's me saying that uh i mean i i, I bragged about some of my own projects recently and i and i know i sounded more arrogant than you do right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So tell us, tell us a little bit about your background. And of course, I, I wanted to hear about all these, uh, the, these projects and how, how you're approaching, you know, your, your, your angle on making the world a better place. Are you encouraging education? First level, second level, what, what's going on? Yeah. Um, so I, first of all, always wanted to become a qualified zoologist and uh, going through, I went through all the different steps of higher education. My aim being to come out the other side and to get the sort of job that people do when they when they come out fully qualified, you know, with a PhD and a master's degree and everything, and be, get tenure and become a university lecturer and also work as a, you know, technical scientist gathering data and publishing on their their field. Um, of course, in reality, it's not quite that simple once you do come out the other side. And um, um, as a as a qualified scientist. Um, my specialization in zoology ultimately led me to uh, dinosaurs and other mesozoic reptiles, which I wasn't one of these people that started out from childhood, you know, wanting to be a dinosaur worker. Uh, I actually really, um, 
I wouldn't say I'm more interested in living animals, but I my my pr my primary interest is in living animals. So I, I would have been happy to become a biologist working on you know bats, cats, elephants, uh, whatever. So long as it was tetrapods, amphibians, reptiles, birds, or mammals, that's my passion uh, in the animal world. Um, so I became fully qualified. Uh, worked for my PhD on predatory dinosaurs, and I happened to be based at the University of Portsmouth here in southern England at a time when a new predatory dinosaur, later named Eotyrannus, that was uncovered, and that was the primary bulk of my PhD was on Eotyrannus, which uh, all these years later, I'm only just getting around to publishing the final <laughs> monograph on it. It's just understanding how long these things take. And while I have worked in academia, uh, I have been a lecturer and I've had a postdoc and all that kind of stuff. Um, I haven't been in the right place at the right time to get the sort of job that I maybe imagined I would. But um, in about 2006, uh, I'd always dabbled in popular writing, writing for magazines and so on, just to get the odd little bit of money here and there. And I opted a blog just randomly one night, Tetrapod Zoology. I, I thought it just looked like fun. Blogging was something I just wanted to do, just because I, you know, I wanted an outlet for my for my thoughts on animals of all kinds. And um, this ultimately took off. Tetrapod Zoology took off. It gathered an increasingly, you know, large and more diverse um, audience over time. And today, the fact that it's a Scientific American, and I certainly can't say I make my living from writing for for that blog, but some of the portion of the money that, <laughs> that I that comes in comes from the blog and related um, um, things um, that that's now like one of the most important things I do and uh, a lot of popular writing jobs have come off the back of the blog now I see my role as a blogger to be a disseminator of scientific information that I feel is uh, in part, not completely, but is in part kind of locked away in the literature. So it really bugs me that if you want this extra depth on, you name it, you name the subject, you know, you, you think of anything, you want this depth on it, you can maybe go and buy a book that will cost, could be, you know, really expensive or the information's in the technical, uh, you know, peer-reviewed literature. Um, it, if you can't get that stuff, how do you get this information? And I find that even today, as fantastic as the internet is, you know, you read Wikipedia pages and stuff that they're on, you often aren't getting this depth. And I feel that my key role um, in life as a as a disseminator of science is to try and get a lot of this information out there. That uh, that yeah, I, I see myself as a disseminator of information. So my my psychom approach, as it were, my approach to scientific communication is doing this like easier to pass distillation of technical information that's otherwise mostly mostly locked away. And the other stuff I do on social media, my activities on you know, Facebook and Twitter and the podcast as well that I do with John Conway, the Tetrapods Audio podcast, these are extra arms of that, the dissemination of technical information on evolutionary history. And um, I, I kind of, I kind of think it's working. I think if you think of an obscure subject, random example, I want to hear about the evolution of gecko toes. So you know, that's, what is there out there on gecko toes? There's some brilliant articles written by gecko specialists, fantastic stuff. But you'll find some what I what I hope are fairly useful summaries. You know, fairly extensive, well illustrated summaries of what we understand, what's in the technical literature, what the various experts have said. You'll find long articles on tetrapod zoology, and I've tried to do that. And I kind of ultimately imagine that one day I will have covered like all the animal groups, you know, not three articles on geckos, but like fifty articles on geckos, and have, will have covered the entire diversity of the gecko kingdom and 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 such for all the animals I'm interested in. But uh, um, that that in you know obviously you have to make a, a living that doesn't work in terms of making a living so off as i said off the back of the blog i've gotten into popular writing and now pretty much full time what i do is um um producing uh popular semi-technical and technical books i'm currently working on this giant textbook but i i've done you know i do like one or two um popular books a year and i also work extensively for um various companies that publish uh, kids' books. I work a lot with Dorling Kindersley and, and Osborne, so, you know, fact-checking and editing and stuff. And uh, while that's something I have to do, yeah, that's kind of a job, that's fairly menial, but uh, 
that still is part of the grand project that I'm involved in because again it's like it's very easy as a scientist to um, give like a superficial veneer of information but the I have learned through extensive experience that the publishers that produce these books for kids often don't have access to the sort of more detailed stuff which they like to have because it's like you look at say a kid's book on dinosaurs your favorite 20 facts on Tyrannosaurus Rex you've seen in every single book but there's still this extra information that is still out there and often it often isn't isn't shared so um one of the comments um, that, was a, that I make about people's knowledge about uh, paleontology, and in particularly vertebrate paleontology, is that everybody seems to think, at least here in the United States, where we're, you know, the, the, the stereotype is that the English are the educated ones, and we certainly are not. And whether that stereotype is true, I don't want to argue right now. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it, it's always been a, a my my perspective growing up in the U.S. that people typically have this idea that you go to, you go into the, the toy section of a grocery store and there's this little plastic bag full of you know, plastic dinosaurs, right? Your pre, your prehistoric play set. And it has, you know, the, the pterodactyl and it has a woolly mammoth and it has a Dimetrodon and these are all labeled as dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that people think that that's, what, that, that there was this handful of, of toys that we have, that these these represented the two dozen maybe prehistoric animals that used to live, and that I, I guess everything else was not modern, normal stuff like, you know, rabbits and foxes and stuff. <laughs> but that, that really is an impression that a lot of people have now. And so it's frustrating to me that you have no idea yeah. how robust the fossil record is that there are so many more things that have lived before than are, than are alive now think about mm. all the animals we have alive now and then multiply that by a hundred for things that nobody's ever seen alive and we only know from bones yeah yeah i'm, I'm with you it's uh i think general thinking is okay so life ev evolves in the ocean and animals crawl onto land there's some giant newt type things, and then dinosaurs, and then there's an ice age, and then there's cave people and mammoths. And well, that's, that's, <laughs> if up, that's if you grew up in the uneducated neighborhoods in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> if you grew up in the US, it's far worse than that. There's Fred Flintstone and Dino, and they both begin at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And then there's yeah, a great yes. flood, and for whatever reason, Dino drowned after that. That, honestly, that's that's uh, that would be roughly half of this country believes something similar to this. Yeah, haven't there actually been polls where the I I, I think we should probably avoid talking about creationism. I know you you you've covered it substantially, but um, yeah, aren't there people who literally believe the Flintstones is basically a documentary? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So, what is uh, what is your motivation? What I mean, I mean, are you trying to do something for other people in this. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, uh, you're working with children's books and everything. So I mean, all of this seems very promising to me. Yes, it's so I would say it's a um, it's a mix of, uh, you know, first of all, the dirty part, which is me actually trying to trying to make a living and survive. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, you know, how do you carve out a niche for yourself? Well, this is the thing that I have. I have done this is uh, I am I'm a, a science writer. And uh, I do publish technical science on the side at great personal expense to myself. None of that is is uh, is funded, but that's uh, that's not a way of. Uh, I I want to be involved in the scientific process, and I am involved. You know, I publish technical papers, work with other people, contribute to technical volumes, uh, engage in field work where possible, discover new species, all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I I do see all of these things as a grand project to basically keep out pushing information that is an effort to make um, the world a better place. So, tetrapod zoology, much of what I've done when I'm writing, I I'm not overly technical, but I do tend to imagine myself writing to a community of people who, let's say, you're writing about the 
evolution of mammals, supials, and monotremes are. You don't have to, you know, spend a thousand words explaining those concepts to start with. Um, but I think I think there's a there's a place for that. We all know there's people that are not specialists. They uh, know enough to you know come in come in at that level and pick up what's uh, what's going on from the the vocabulary and um, technical terms uh, used. And I, what I, th I think I do all the time is you know sometimes I need to find my own illustrations. If you Google the any of the names for the groups of animals I've written about, you'll see the you know um, the uh, Representative illustrations from the stuff I've written about are among the, the the top hits, which indicates to me that that the project is working, that the stuff the stuff is out there. If you want to find out about, again, you know, I, I can think of lots of random examples. You want to read about the evolution of bats. It's how much stuff is there. There's there's not there's not much, but you'll find, you know, in the your first page of Google hits, you will find some of the some of the stuff that, that I've put out there, which um yeah, as I said, otherwise. Otherwise, isn't readily available unless you have got those expensive textbooks or those frequently paywalled uh, scientific journals. So, yeah. um, yeah, the way I found out about you was I was doing a project some years ago that required me to study an area that I hadn't spent a lot of time even reading about, and this was uh, the evolution of pterosaurs. And your name came up again and again and again. So clearly this is the guy to talk to and i've noticed it when you when you when you look at any specific area of paleontology i mean it, it's always the same name comes up for this speciality so that's the guy i got to talk to and it was you and uh, you were you were enormously helpful with the presentation that i eventually did on that and i want to thank you by the way for for uh, also cluing me into uh, a, a couple of different uh, groups of let's say pseudoscientists that were trying to interject their own realities <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah, instead yeah. of the accepted science yeah well well thanks for your kind comments yeah i i remember uh, our exchanges at that time and um so this is a, this is a, a whole subject that i could talk about for a long time and i'll try not to discuss it linger on it too long because i've i've covered it at depth but if you think of what i've just been saying about the dissemination of information putting stuff online so you know curious people they find not not the google is everything and the emphasize i'm not obsessed with, <laughs> with specific search engines but there is a researcher in vertebrate paleontology who's phenomenally good at getting his stuff online and he is insanely productive he produces lengthy articles and new illustrations literally every day no no exaggeration literally every day he's a guy called david peters and um he's he's a smart guy He's uh he's very good at uh, producing uh, illustrations. He's you know uh, obviously really smart, but he has gone down. You're familiar with this already. He's gone down this specific path of thinking that he uh, he has a novel approach to the things he's interested in, and he thinks that he's got the answers. And when his answers are different from those of everyone else, he thinks that's because he is likely right. And everyone else, the entire community of researchers that presents a different interpretation, they are likely wrong. And the reason they're wrong is because they're operating in some kind of pseudo conspiracy. He is a he is a conspiracy theorist, whether he likes it or not. And uh, when I say that he's used unusual techniques, uh, I understand he. Well, I, I know for a fact he has looked at fossils in person, but he generally looks at images. Um, on his computer, and he uses a couple of different uh, techniques in Photoshop to, um, but basically find elements in fossils, as in like scattered on the slabs and you know mingled among the bones. You can see he reckons he can see stuff that no one else has. He sees, found. He, he sees things no one else can see. Yep. Yeah, so, he's got yeah, a kind I of. A... Saw, I saw an illustration that you did, and, and uh, like you, I don't want to spend any time really bashing on another person, but, but uh, like you, I, I, I saw the illustration that, that maybe you did. Uh, it, it, uh, it was a uh, longasquama. Uh, mm -hmm. However much was found of it, you know, there was the, you don't have a full fossil of the animal at all. So I, I think it was just the, like maybe the first half of the animal. Yep. And uh, I've seen a number of depictions or uh, drawings or whatever of, of how they. How they interpret the fossils that they if they found if they could see it alive and they only draw the part that they that they have and uh somehow this other guy 
imagined that he saw the whole rest of the fossil and every every aspect or feature that he had that did he, did he sees are things that nobody else can find and then it's got mm -hmm. four wings and uh, a, a, a flu of different feathers and <laughs> that's right yeah yeah <laughs> And at various times, I mean, he's claimed that Longisquama, you're absolutely right, he's claimed that not only is the whole, the entirety of that specimen of Longisquama there, you know, everything to the tip of the tail, but sometimes he said there's several babies on the slab crawling oh, on the parent, and and he's done this for, you know, all, all the animals now. Uh, to start with, he was interested, uh, you know, as you've said, only in pterosaurs, and... Uh, but he but he then branched into all other reptiles and then into all of all mammals and all other synapsids and all amphibian type animals and then into fish as well and he's he's currently air quotes doing birds and um these his obs his his observations which are based on this technique and are not consistent with the observations of people that have actually looked at the fossils he uses those observations to then inform his hypotheses as goes phylogeny functional morphology biology you know everything and it's like this is a house of cards because if your interpretation in the first place is invalid and i'm sure that you know i'm super confident that you know, more than 90 percent of them at least are you know flawed having having looked at the same specimens and seen how he does this stuff that uh, so, so yeah we <laughs> we could talk about him for a long time but he's I was misled by this guy because when I did I did a recent presentation on one of my video series on the systematic classification of life, I mentioned Longisquama, and I I said it that it was it was uh, uh, categorized as a lepidosaur when in fact it was not. David Peters categorized it as a lepidosaur, and the entire rest of the scientific community said it was an archosaur. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm getting my information from this very prolific publisher. Who's who? By the fact that he manages to put so much stuff online so rapidly and and so and with such volume, <clears> that he is drowning out the actual scientific community. Yes. Yeah, so this is when when I, when I I I hate when I've been deceived, especially when I then repeat that lie. Mm, you know mm. that I've been misinformed. That that irritates me no end. I mean, it's bad enough if you fool me, but then if I perpetuate that and fool somebody else, that's that's even worse. Yeah. So this is the flip side. This is the dark side of what I was talking about a minute ago, how important it is to put information out there when you've got someone who is so good at putting out information that, as, as you've just you know confirmed, is good enough that it can that it can fool people who don't know. Best case. So uh, when I was uh, a lecturer at the University of Southampton, um, I repeatedly told students, you know, you are not to use this guy's stuff, and <laughs> you'll get you'll get marked down if you if you do. But we, we would still have some students who who would because through no fault of their own, they would see it and think it's think it's kosher. So uh, his Just stuff is anything in paleontology, anything in vertebrate paleontology, as you know. If you try mm -hmm. to Google anything, I mean, you're going to either get the website of pterosaur heresies. Mm. or reptileevolution.com where this guy has mm. exhaustively created his whole own, he, he has a, his own unique cladogram constructed entirely off of some weird li literally heresy from from the rest of the scientific community and how somebody can devote so much of their time to this yeah it, it's, wow. it's mind-boggling to me but anyway, yeah, enough, I, enough about that guy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, we could we could go on, but uh, yes. So I have I written a long a long article that's meant to be a response to his stuff, and yeah. So I I, I do recommend people read that. <laughs> okay, well, very good. Um, I am um, uh, before we. I want to say that before we started recording. Uh, you had invited me to speak at uh, the, the Tetsu conference in London, which I wasn't expecting, but I, I, I very much appreciate uh, that invitation. I accept and I will be happy to. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. And uh, did, you, did you get a chance to see the, the project that I asked you about? Oh, well, we can pro we'll probably talk about that later on. Uh, but hang on after the end, because I've got a couple of geeky questions for you. <laughs> Before we close it out, uh, I wanted to make sure that we we've covered everything that you wanted to bring up. Is there anything anything you can think of that you want to throw in before we end the podcast? Um, 
well, if I just quickly mention, uh, so I said I publish books. Um, the newest one is called Evolution in Minutes. So it's a, a, a popular and pretty affordable, you know, cheap guide to everything about uh, evolutionary theory. Uh, and I've also published um, a, a recently a book called Dinosaurs, How They Lived and Evolved. It's written with uh, Paul Barrett at the Natural History Museum, which uh, I think is a pretty good summary of our current understanding of everything about the evolution and biology of, of dinosaurs. So those are my two newest books. And uh, if people want to help support me and read what I do, then I, I'd recommend uh, but it'd be great if you get those books. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. I will make sure that the links to those and to your Patreon will be included below. Oh, thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, Darren Nash, if that was it, then uh, thank you very much for being on. Yeah, thank you for having me. Enjoyed it. Thank you.